Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 715. This is 715 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope you're doing well. Wherever this podcast may find you, I hope you are doing swimmingly. How am I? Yeah, not the best. I'm not going to lie. Not the best, but I'm getting there little by little. I had a bit of a tough weekend, especially with the news concerning Manchester United's ownership and the sale and whatnot has put me in a bit of a downer. And unfortunately, I'm one of those sport fans that although I've been abused um, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally by Manchester United, I still remain hopeful when I hear of some potential good news that suddenly, you know, that they might be a light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, I should probably know better because the owners that we have at the moment seem to be hell-bent on extinguishing that hope whenever it gets close. So it's probably my own fault. But I'm not going to lie, it did affect my weekend to the point where I didn't go out. You know, that's how bad it was. I had a free ticket to go out and do what I wanted to do, have a good time. I had a bit of money in my pocket. I could have gone out and had a blast, but I actually didn't because of the news concerning Man United. And I'm going to be speaking about that later on in the pod. But I hope wherever you are, you've had a far better weekend than I have. You've had a good start of your week already and you're eager and willing to listen to me ramble, rant and just, you know, um, bloviate on this podcast as I usually do. So thank you for tuning in. So. During this weekend, actually, or this past weekend, I did something that's quite funny because I think it might be like a subconscious reaction um, to what's been happening at Man United. For some reason, out of the blue, I was like, you know what? Let me just start watching Flipping The Walking Dead. I've never watched it because I'm not super into horror. I'm not really into, what do you call it, horror? I'm not really super into like zombie stuff. I don't really give a fuck. Um, I feel like they're all the same. Um, they, they get kind of boring after a while. They kind of get kind of quite repetitive. And to be fair anyway, um, I did bail out at The Walking Dead from like season four. I kind of bailed out. Um, I think I finished season four, but I, I didn't really want to continue it after that because I thought it was getting quite repetitive. But I have to be honest, I understand the hype. I understand the hype around The Walking Dead a lot now that I've watched it. I fully, fully get The Walking Dead hype. And I really did have a good time sort of watching it and whatnot. And it kind of reminded me, actually, it reminded me of why I feel like modern day TV and movies have been so lackluster in the last few years. Because maybe it's because The Walking Dead was written maybe a few years ago, if I'm not mistaken. It might have been like 2007 or something like that. And around then, I feel like the whole political, ideologically possessed theme or trend that we have now at the moment wasn't as prominent. Nowadays, um, instead of just doing like representative movie making or making sure that the, the cast are just diverse based on just their acting skills alone, what they can offer, not having the same old people in flipping roles, not whitewashing roles. Like the other day, I saw a clip. No, the other day, sorry, I watched half of flipping them. Um, Ghost in the Shell, the legendary anime and manga, and it stars Scarlett Johansson in it. And it's fucking hilarious because Scarlett Johansson looks nothing like the lead woman in A Ghost in the Shell. Um, so, you know, whatever. They put her in there because she's the most famous white actress they could get who probably matches that role. And it was pretty horrible casting wise. And um, all that sort of stuff I think is annoying because no one's saying you should only hire Asian actors to play, um, you know, anime based kind of characters when they get into a movie adaptation, which would be nice. But let's at least maybe go for an interesting option, one that hasn't been kind of, you know, thought of before, not the most obvious and bait one, whatever. Diversity boxes and all that sort of stuff get on my nerves. And the only reason why they get on my nerves, really, especially when it comes to movies, is because they don't lead to good storytelling. It's not as if they, they get these writers in based on their, you know, what they kind of represent, what they kind of present as or based on their race. And then there are also amazing writers too who have fresh new ideas. It's just them essentially trying to create the world that they would like to live in via a movie or it's just really basic writing. So it doesn't really fix anything. So that's the thing that kind of is annoying. And then, and then obviously in the effect of that, we the customer, we're the ones that quote unquote get punished because we then get subpar products. So I think The Walking Dead did a really good job of depicting the characters in that series as neither good no bad, somewhere in between. They were all kind of great. And I love the fact that in for the first four seasons that I watched anyway, the main dude who kind of plays like the good guy, the Superman, the hero dude, Rick, who's the policeman, every time he faces an opponent, a villain, a bad guy, 
there's a lot of each other. They see a lot of each other in in each other, right? It's kind of like a mirror. They're holding up to each other because one person's been brought up or has had different experiences um trying to navigate the world now that it's been ravaged by flipping um zombies and everyone's passed away and society has fallen down and they have to make a new thing they're all trying to just make sense of it but they're neither evil no good it's just whatever kind of you know allows their group their people to survive the longest and i love that kind of duality and that kind of con you know that kind of friction that exists in the show and if anything it makes a pretty average basic show premise stand out because the characters in it the actors in it do a marvelous job of portraying that they do a really good job of kind of displaying what it would be like falling into the depths of psychosis right how you can sometimes let your emotions um, and your feelings of situation that you're in sort of like change you um, you see it with the kid as well where how he slowly and surely starts to become very cold very distant um, he grows up too quickly probably um, and then he has other flashes where you can see sort of like the adolescence in him come out but I think all that stuff is super interesting and I also love that I think in the past when I was when I would watch these um, post-apocalyptic type things that sort of deal with our own morality and existence and shit, especially once the world has gone down, it used to get on my nerves because there'd always be one or two characters in it who were just hell-bent on returning back to normal. I just want to get back to normal. <sighs> Crying, right? Where they'd want to go, they want to have a party, they want to drink, they want to dance, um, whatever, right? They want to scream and shout. Like there'll, be, there'll always be a character that's just annoying because whatever they're doing or whatever they want to do, is super loud and will essentially get the rest of the group in trouble or lead to their death. But having gone through what we went through with the plague, so with the plague, basically it was a plague, having gone through what we went through with the pandemic with COVID, it does make a lot of sense. There were a lot of people during the during COVID. I wasn't one of them, which is nice to be fair, because I can be sometimes quite panicky in my own places. But I I was a little bit of a of a dilettante like i follow the news i follow the science i was like keep it in place i was doing all that really losery stuff but there were some people who were panicking that they would never have their normal lives restored again so they were doing everything in their power to live their normal lives within the restrictions that were given to them they would push the line all the flipping time and it'd be a constant battle with them to kind of just like relax relax they wouldn't relax 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 wouldn't relax and you saw some people get a little bit too crazy right and it literally affected their their you know their flipping state of mind which is also sad to see but i feel like that depiction is based in reality because we saw it with covid we saw it with covid in hd people just not knowing what to do with themselves now that all of their sort of like you know creature comforts and leisure activities and things that they that kind of give them meaning was kind of shipped away from them and if anything i think for me it just gave me an appreciation of the things I do have because, you know, um, sometimes we all know the saying, comparisons of thief of joy, but sometimes you can't af avoid it, especially when you're amongst your peer group and different people are doing different things and some people are striving and you're maybe stuck in the same position. It can be hard not to compare yourself with other people and think, damn, man, if only I did that, if only I did this. But what COVID and the pandemic did is that it gave me a lot of appreciation. It made me very, um, you know, yeah, basically, I, I just felt like grateful that the things that I did have were worth, um, were worth the time that I invested in them. And I was going to make sure that once I was able to do them again, I wouldn't take it for granted. That's essentially what happened. And I feel like in this series, The Walking Dead, the thing that really makes it interesting is that there doesn't seem to be any hope, <laughs> you know? There isn't a light in the tunnel. I think that's the only little criticism I'll say of these type of shows. They're a little bit too much of a Debbie Downer. There's never a light in the tunnel. Like, there's never, like, every time they think, every time there's a rumour of some, like, you know, utopia, some mecca, some place where people are safe and they don't have to keep their, their eye open in terms of zombies. Um, they can flip and relax. They could, their children could grow up in relative peace, education. Whenever there's a place like that, it always gets overrun or something happens and blah, blah, blah. There's, it's just never safe. Ever, 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 ever. Which is a really sad part about the whole entire series. And the other thing about it also, I would have wanted there to be a little bit more of a look at how society fell and how they're trying to restore it like that would have been pretty interesting to see because i think sometimes a lot of these zombie series can get 
way too much in the weeds with the interpersonal conflicts and relationships and drama and shit which to me feels a bit soap opery and not really my vibe but i know that people do enjoy that but i would love to see how you start again right how you have people contributing to society what does government look like what does the police look like how do you deal with people who commit crimes blah 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 all these things would be quite interesting to see in terms of you know answering different questions of what type of um you know government is best in these sort of places whatever if that was ever happened in real life but i guess you can't really suspect real life things in these sort of occasions but one of the best things i loved about the show like i said before was that no one was either fully bad or fully good and the best example of that was this character called mel in the show who's depicted as the neo-nazi um trailer trash white guy right um who espouses some very dicey dicey views on the people that look like me um women and shit and whatever it may be right and society at large and throughout the entire show he kind of until the moment he dies he sort of has a redemption arc and it's also good to see that although he's got these really um you know bad traits or these bad personality things or the bad way he looks at the world there is certain things that he will never do he has certain lines in the sands there are certain things that to him seem just unforgivable and i love that one of them was rape there's one of the people in it who's a villain in i think season two or three and um he basically walks in on that guy looking like he's gonna rape this girl that he took hostage and or for interrogation to find out where the other camp is and it immediately startles him immediately kind of startles him even though he doesn't know the girl or anything it startles him it doesn't make him feel well and then he sort of starts to realize oh the guy i'm working for the guy who's my boss is not only a quote-unquote badass in terms of what he does he's also a little bit sick this guy needs to be stopped i need to stop him and from then on you kind of see it kind of sows a seed of like um rev it kind of sows a seed of rebelism in his head where he's like you know what I'm going to make sure that I end this guy's life. I'm going to put an end to this. And in the end, unfortunately, at least he definitely doesn't, but it does go some way to sort of redeem his image and what he basically is like on the show. And I think like nowadays, that kind of character who's the resident, you know, uh, right winger, loves Trump, neo-Nazi character will never have a redeeming quality. They'll always be painted as completely, completely just an evil person and they'll probably die a spectacular death. And I feel like, we need more of that type of storytelling because that's more reflective of actual real life. And even if it wasn't, it poses far better interesting premises and questions for the viewer to ponder over and consider. It's not just so black and white because life, unfortunately, isn't so black and white either. And I feel like when it comes to like shows, one of the examples being Star Trek Discovery with the main actress being somebody who also was in The Walking Dead earlier on, um she's incredibly annoying on that show if you watch star trek discovery only because there's nothing that she does that's quote unquote wrong everything that she does is somewhat justifiable even if it's her being selfish putting the the rest of the group in jeopardy be, being self-centered um you know being unwilling to work with, with a team um not wanting to acquiesce to authority all these type of things in the series are annoying to watch as a viewer but for some reason as it's been written, it's like, oh no, everything that she did, although it wasn't a good thing, in the end, everyone got it was a good thing. There are never like really deep, bad consequences for the things that she does. There are minor inconveniences, but not like consequences that could lead to somebody's death like we saw in The Walking Dead. Like someone just, you know, might have the good grace to let somebody go, but letting that person go might lead to the death of certain people in your group turning a blind eye to certain things might lead to a death of certain people like there's one really like innocent thing which is really sad where the kid in the show i think his name is carl the main character's son he wanders off because again you know the, the kids in this show are kind of annoying but you also understand that it's sort of similar to real life too because kids are fucking annoying and you'd imagine living in a post-apocalyptic world where you don't see any future in sight for you and most likely you think you're gonna die and you just want to have a normal kind of kid's existence you're going to wonder and try and do things because you're just bored of sitting around feeling you know sad for yourself so the kid wanders off and tries to explore and he happens to stumble across a zombie a walker as they say on the show and he has a little scuffle with the zombie escapes with his life thankfully because i think the zombie gets stuck on something whatever happens right he's fortunate to get away 
But as a real kid, he gets scared and doesn't want to tell his parents because if he tells his parents, they're going to find out he walked away and he's going to get in big trouble. So he kind of keeps it to himself for what happened. But unfortunately, that same walker that he failed to stop was the same walker that then came back later on and killed somebody else in the group. A dear, like, you know, a loved member in the group. And he was feeling so cut up that he eventually did tell his parents about it. But, you know, by that time, the guy's already dead. What, what can you do? And I feel like those tragic, r really brutal um, consequences of a show really do a good job of making the show be grounded in some basis of reality. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of why I like that show. I can't remember the name. I think it was 192 or something like that. It was, it was a numbers. It's like this Canadian TV show um, based on police over there. And it was really good, really good because of that incredibly harsh realities of what it must be like to be a police officer in a major city in Canada where they've got intersection of like, you know, organized crime, uh, biker gangs, drugs, immigration, unemployment, the wealth gap, all these sort of things interjecting at the same time. And then they've also got, if I'm not mistaken, in that series, the police department is severely under underfunded, right? And you've got people essentially trying to scam or, you know, basically finagle hours to get more money and whatever the pressure of society did. And I love that in that show, there are things that happen to police officers where they die or get in tragic situations that are just the most minor thing that sort of like spirals into something crazy and i think that's what essentially would happen if you're a police officer right you'd really have to be have your head in the swivel mind your p's and q's and never take anything for face value everything has to be questioned because it could be a life and death situation so again i'm sure most of you know about the walking dead and i'm really late on it like i said before um i'm not gonna watch the entire things so like 11 seasons i tapped out of four um a lot of it for the end of it i tried to skip around because some of the dialogue when he gets soapy and i want to marry you i want to have children whatever i don't give a fuck but the general premise of the show very well done not gonna lie very well done very impressed and again like i said i, I just wish there'll be a little improvements here and there but some of the acting performances i'm not surprised some of them got some awards because they've done it really good that that spiraling into depression anxiety um the panic attacks whatever all this sort of stuff i thought was incredible so i big up everybody on that show um for what they did and of course um you know i get the zombie thing we all kind of you know what's the thing question our own mor mortality from time to time especially the older you get so it makes sense why these shows capture people so much and i guess we all have this inflated sense of self we all probably think we would be the rick character leading people but most likely would be like you know whoever the cowering coward is in the corner that's the reality situation, but in your head, you always think you're going to be the, you know, the Rick character. You're going to stand up for justice. You're going to be defending people, you know, whatever, but most likely you're going to be the carrying one in the corner waiting for the people who went out to hunt to come back with the food for you to eat on. So it's depressing, but hey, what can you do? What can you do? Next, let's talk about something that's even more depressing than, you know, being ravaged by a horde of flesh-eating zombies. United, Manchester United, my beloved club, unfortunately, have now concluded this very protracted, um, purposely stretched out Manchester United sale, where the Glazers initially made it seem like they were open to a full sale. But in the end, it seems like after the six month mark, they were only really interested in selling a portion of the club, which is really depressing for a fan like myself, who just wanted a fresh start. I didn't really care if it was Sergio Ratcliffe. I didn't really care if it was somebody else and not the Qatari group. I just wanted a fresh start. We've had the Glazers for more than 20 years. It's been an abject failure for me personally, but even if it wasn't a failure, I just want a fresh start and want some new eyes and new vision in terms of leading the club forward because at the moment, considering the level of competition that exists in the in the you know domestically and in Europe, um, it just seems like we are lagging behind. And the more that we have the Glazers in charge running the club, the further behind we will lag because we have 20 plus years of experience and evidence to show that they never make the, the decisions that will eventually lead us to have, have it, to us having long term, consistent um, success or competitiveness on the level that we kind of want. It doesn't exist. So I was wearing the full change for that reason alone and mostly to be really soppy to sort of like 
fall back in love with my club again because for the longest time i refused to engage with the social media of manchester united i refused to buy any official merchandise um i refused to buy you know um any subscription to their mutv which i used to do before like all these things that i did prior i refused to because i don't want to enable or give money to the glazers who have done nothing right by the united um fan base except for buy players to you know temporarily appease us at certain points but when it comes to long-term um f planning for success or having us consistently compete because i don't think any united fan with sense is thinking we're deserving of trophies because we're not no one is but we just want to compete like we did before we want the seasons to actually count for something are we actually going to compete for the league are we actually going to compete for the champions league for our other domestic cups no we're just there to make up the numbers but essentially we're not going to really compete or push these teams and we don't really have a belief that's going to happen unless all the teams have like a chelsea season then we might take it and even then it's no guarantee that we will so the really sad news to come out of over this past weekend has been the following courtesy of sky sports news it says Sergio Ratcliffe to buy 1.3 billion for 25% stake in Man United. So the whole full sale thing is gone. Our preferred bidder, if you are somebody that wanted a full sale in Sheikh Jassim, has now left. Now it's only Sergio Ratcliffe and he's only taking 25%. When the original story that came out said he wanted to have like 59 or 49, now it's down to 25%. And now you have all these um, Man United propaganda PR machine Twitter accounts, which are incredibly annoying, which makes sense because we're one of the biggest companies in the world. So it makes sense that there's these sort of like weird accounts that sort of exist to give United fans news, but also to kind of do the bidding of certain people within the club it's very odd how it works at the moment but certain accounts will post certain things where certain journalists who will have the ear of the owners or people on the inside who want a certain message to get out it's oddly weird but i find it very interesting that since this really depressing news that Sergio Rekhoff is taking over the club and if it all goes through and gets voted in i think on thursday for 25 percent only suddenly now we're seeing all these buzzwords pop up on the timeline about structure about Sergio Ratcliffe taking over the footballing side of the club and having full control of it and blah de blah blah de blah there's a lot of that kind of you know talk that you'd see a lot of fans like myself and others say on social media that we think is a the crux of our issues which generally is about the lack of you know structure and organization at the club that's basically led to us being in a position where we don't really run that well and obviously that's effectively affecting our performance on the pitch and not leading us to be as successful as we can be the club is now basically saying hey even though it's not the full sale that you wanted and we did kind of do a bit of a switcheroo on you this guy is going to come in and fix the things that you want you want fixed that's the things that you're worried about the structure all of a sudden they're throwing out those terms so to me it feels like a little bit of a ruse and to be fair i don't believe anything that they say and they've got 20 plus years of documented evidence they've got 20 plus years of work experience on their cv that shows us that they disappoint us at every single hurdle every single point they always disappoint and let down the fans to the point where you're thinking to yourself these guys don't care about the club. They only care about the money they make from the club, which is probably the reason why they also refuse to full sell. Because looking at their portfolio, the things that the Glazer families own, Man United, although it's maybe one of the most performing, worst performing teams or whatever they operate on, we still make a lot of money uh, in general compared to the debt we have and shit, especially considering who we have in charge and the stadium and lack of resource, all that sort of stuff. We still make a very good amount of money. And most likely unless a disaster happens we're never going to get relegated so we're most likely going to finish within the top six top four most seasons we're one of the biggest clubs in the world so you can understand why the Glazers wouldn't want to sell because that is an atm quote unquote for life they can keep on withdrawing money from the bank of Manchester united forever and ever and ever without really investing any of their own money which they haven't right like the whole entire tenureship of our ownership sorry of the glazers they've never invested one pound one dollar of their own money into the club which is kind of crazy when you think about it right they've not really been personally invested or wanted to put their money in the line at any fucking point and that just goes to show how 
disinterested they are in the sport and success of the club, but also goes to show the amount of crazy money this club must make um, to um, obviously allow them to do such a thing. But some of the reports and some of the information from this article really do make you super depressed. So it says as follows. Surgeon record will pay $1.3 billion for 25% of Man United after Qatari businessman Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad Al-Tahini withdrew from the bidding process. Sheikh Jassim's offer, which valued the club at more than $5 billion, was believed to be the only bid for 100% of the club. But it's understood that the Qatari suit valuation was not sufficient for the Glazers, who have owned the club since 2005. Also, Sheikh Jassim has withdrawn for the process. So, sorry. Um, the other proposal is to buy 25% of the club by Ratcliffe, who has said that he has been a fan of the club since childhood, with a deal beginning to be agreed, or needed to be agreed, sorry, by the United Board this coming week, allegedly Thursday. So that's the really crazy part. It sounds like Sergeant Ratcliffe has overpaid for 25%, which makes sense because I remember at the time, at the time I remember precisely, the Glazers' language when they put the club up for sale, quote-unquote, was very odd because it sounded like to me that they wanted investment. It didn't sound like they wanted a full sale. It sounded like what they wanted in an ideal world, which is crazy considering the economic situation we're in, the, the you know, whatever, like whatever you believe, but we're definitely in some sort of economical situation. Um, what you wouldn't, un there's not a lot of money available out there, even in terms of like VC and stuff, right? There's not a lot of people investing big, huge amounts out there. People are being a little bit more, you'd say risk adverse. And considering how poorly we're doing on the pitch and considering the money that would be needed to get us back up to the level that we want, it didn't seem likely that there'd be an investor that'd be willing to invest a huge amount for very little ownership of the club or very little say so of the club it doesn't make any sense really so i always thought that was a bit of a pipe dream but in my head i also thought it's savvy businessman type of negotiation tactics whatever from the glazers because what they always wanted i felt like was to sell chunks or small pieces of the club along a very stretched out time so they could get more money in the end so essentially, if they give 25% up to Sir Jim Ratcliffe, they could then, in theory, still collect money from the club. And later on down the line, if, let's say, by a miracle, 25% ownership for, for Jim Ratcliffe means that he can do the things he wants to do to get the club back to where it needs to get to, restore the former glory, blah, blah, blah. Let's just imagine it goes well. It's not, but let's just imagine it does. Technically, if the club performs better, they can obviously go out there and try to get more investors to invest for a higher price point than what Sir Jim Ratcliffe paid. So they could effectively, if they wanted to sell 25% again, or less than that, or more than that, for way more than 1.3 billion that um, Sir Jim Ratcliffe play, paid. And then in the end, sell the remaining stock for another increased fee. So they could easily, if they wanted to, it's just kind of crazy to think that, but they could easily, if they wanted to, think in their heads, we could maybe get 20 billion for this club over a long period of time, if they wanted to really, you know, um, drip sell it, piece by piece by piece and obviously drain the club of resources drain the club of any sort of joy but if they wanted to go that down that route of being ultra greedy ultra menacing ultra pieces of shit which they clearly are they could do that and bleed the club dry over a long period of time and i suspect most likely that will end up happening because to reject five billion and i think most of it was in cash or whatnot off the mark means that most likely their true valuation which they didn't want to say because probably it would make bad for headlines and whatnot, was 10 billion or somewhere around that mark, maybe eight. So, so by what the article is saying, Sheikh Jassim already offered over the valuation of the club, the current valuation of the club, considering everything that's going on with it, I think someone said, is around the three to four billion. Sheikh Jassim offered more than the actual value for it and still wasn't given it. Still wasn't, you know, still couldn't conclude the deal. So clearly the Glazers think the club is worth more than what it's being valued at. They think it's probably worth north of six billion, which is fucking wild considering the state of disrepair left the club in. And again, the funny thing about it is if the Glazers cared 10% more than they do about the footballing success of the club, they could maybe have gotten the money that they wanted. If they would have invested more into the infrastructure, into recruitment, into sales, 
and removed some of the idiots who are in charge of doing that from their side of things like the Joels and Avrams of this fucking world who really do have the final say so at the club because that's really the major issue that we have there's just too many lines of management and boardroom people you have to get through to to fucking ratify and sign things on the dotted line every agent that's kind of dealt with united has always said on podcasts that one of the main things that they kind of hear back from people is that it's really hard to work with united unless somebody's going to make good money it's just hard to get fucking deals over the line because they just have to go through so many intermediaries they have to kind of deal with um in order to get things ratified where other clubs have like a very clear easy line of communication um or like kind of approval you can kind of go through one or two three steps and whatnot and it's kind of done with united there's a million and one people involved they all kind of feel like they have a sense of you know ownership duty and power in every sort of role they stretch it out for their own good way themselves look better as you know in most corporations but in the end it leads to delay after delay after delay after flipping delay and it is so honestly annoying it really is but let's continue reading the article here um Radcliffe and his company NEOS expected to run Man United for football operations as part of the deal to purchase 25 percent the petrochemicals billionaire initially went to buy um the gain of 67 percent of shareholding so the interesting thing about this last sentence is that if you consider back to the beginning Sergeant Records has said that he is a somewhat boyhood fan of United I think that's a lie because I don't think any boyhood fan of United will be comfortable or happy. Number one, getting in bed or working with the Glazers and number two, doing it at such a small percentage because there's not a part of me that thinks he's ever going to have the control or the ownership that he thinks he's going to have for 25%. The Glazers have proved over the years that they have a weird refusal to let go of the things they're not good at doing just because I guess it's their job. It's strange because on paper, or just from the outside looking in, it's clear to see that the football operational side of our business, of our club, is the worst performing part of it. We can't buy well, we can't sell well, our squad is full of a mashup of players from, you know, 10 different fucking managers, bloody blah, 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 there's toxic fucking, you know, dressing room culture, all that stuff you'd think is footballing issues that could get sorted out if you brought football people in the club maybe simplify the process maybe had some things in, in, you know maybe implement some process whatever there may be you think that that sort of stuff is rectifiable and you'd also think if you're an owner that doesn't care about that sort of thing and so sort of cares about your money surely you'd want to get people involved in the football side of things you could deal with it but the days over a period of time have kind of shown a um a uh they've kind of shown a refusal to relinquish the control that they have that they haven't been good at like look how long it took us to get rid of ed woodward we always thought ed woodward was a big bo boogeyman at fucking man united that was the reason why we were where we were and of course he leaves and the mistakes keep continuing we technically got a football director now in john murto and obviously darren fletcher is some sort of technical sporting director type of role but has anything really changed not really we still don't buy well. We still don't sell well. The squad is still lopsided, unbalanced. Um, again, like I said, many players from 10 different fucking managers. It really doesn't make any sense. So clearly, there's an issue there. So Sergeant Bracker thinking he's going to be able to correct that 20 plus years of bad decision making with 25%. Not going to happen, bro. Not going to happen. He's going to be a glorified employee. He's going to be a glorified employee and most likely you'll start hearing murmurs about him not being happy of not being given carte blanche to do what he wants, always having to revert and go back to Joe or Avram Grant or whatever his fucking name is to Glazer, sorry, to kind of get things over the line. It's going to be absolutely a horror show, I guarantee you. Um, and then also we got here a list, sorry, from um, Gary Neville, 16 questions of mainland minority investment, which is a fairly decent list. So I big up him for actually putting this out there once the news came out. I guess he tried to, okay, cool. It's disappointing news. The guitar is uninvolved, but let's try and get to the bottom of, to, of what that minority stake means. Like, what are the actual deliverables? What can the fans expect to see? Because there's a lot of, you know, buzzword talk on social, but there's not a lot of concrete kind of specification on like, what is 25%? 
What does that mean for the club? How does that affect the running of the club? Bloody blah, blah, blah. So some of the questions he has here, I'll read quite a few. It says, what does the distribution of the funds look like? Is it all cash being taken out of the club? What glazers are going to, what glazers are going or is the family um, going to be dilution? How does it impact the NY shareholders? Does the executive stay the same? Does the sporting decide stay the same about the manager? Who within the board has support, sporting control? Are the future the, 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 um, deal dilutions clauses with the Glazer family in the, in the deal and married to a shareholder Mainland is maxed out on the credit and debt how is this deal going to change the capital structure and financial status is any further debt being placed is any debt being paid off how does the deal impact the board comp composition like really great answer questions here which are probably never going to get answered but big up guy never putting them out there and then this is a scathing review scathing review for one of the sources um at fucking sky sports news that really does put into really clear way why this deal is pretty horrible for united fans and why it's probably bad for jim ratcliffe himself so <clears throat> it says the following shay Sim offered them almost double the market capitalization he has a cash he was a cash buyer he was going to clear all the debt so oh my god i'm just getting angry reading it he was going to clear all the debt there would have been no new debt and he was going to put in another 1.4 billion for the stadium and the team. And I'm hearing rumors on the timeline that he was looking to sign Mbappe and shit. Oh my God. Um, all that still wasn't enough for the Glazers. What we're left with now is almost a year and someone who is going to overpay for 25% of the club. They're arguably the greatest, most historic club in the planet. And after a year, there's just one bidder that can only stump up enough for 25%, which obviously, in my opinion, is a scathing review and indictment of where the club is at the moment. It's not worthwhile, especially in the financial situation, economic situation we're in now in the world markets. It's just not financially prudent to spend that kind of money on a stock like Man United, considering the amount of work that will need to get done to improve it right the the stadium the training facilities all these sort of things the youth set up they're gonna cost a lot of money to get right so the the glazers refusal to invest in those parts of the business of the club and kind of have it in a state of disrepair has what has negative impact their ability to sell it for the price that they want right it's kind of there's sort of like a weird climate retribution they're going on but the only people that suffer are us the fans because the glazers don't give a fuck because eventually they'll still get their money that they want. They'll just have to get it over a longer period of time. And they'll also have to hope in the back of their heads that Ericsson Hogg is their Sir Alex Ferguson. Because that's one thing I've said from the beginning. I've always said that considering how terrible our owners are, we are never going to win a major trophy until the Glazers leave. Or if we're ever lucky to stumble across Sir Alex Ferguson region. I don't see us ever winning a major trophy which counts as an FA Cup, a Champions League or a Premier League title. Forget Europa League and fucking League Cup. I don't give a fuck. But we're not going to win those three major ones ever again if we don't get rid of the Glazers or we find a Sir Alex Ferguson regen, which is obviously super unlikely too. So in, the, in, in essence, Glazers fucked themselves. We continue. Ratcliffe is overpaying and any valuation higher than Sheikh Jassim's is sheer lunacy. If he can only afford to buy 25% of the to start with, which obviously is 25% and it's also not his own money, think about that. Who is going to pay for the new stadium? Who is going to fix the leaking roof? Who is going to pay for a new training centre, new players and community projects? We don't know. Um, United can keep, can't keep up with Brighton these days. <laughs> Never mind Manchester City and Liverpool and Arsenal. And I don't even think about the likes of Real Madrid and Bayern Munich. And if they're going with Ratcliffe, they get yet another shareholder. How does that help decision making? Where is the new vision, new ambition? Where is the new engagement with the fans? Sheikh Justin tried to bridge the gap between reality and lunacy. Valuation, he did his best. And the funny thing about it, there's a quote going around on social media at the moment especially from all the fan forums, right? And big up this picture, which is super depressing, but I think accurately displays the place that we're at now as a club, to, to be honest, right? This sort of like, you know, you've got Joel and Avram Grant and you're standing outside the Old Trafford and it's burning and you're just watching it from afar, just smiling, right? But there's a quote here from the United Plug Twitter account. I forgot which especially it was, but there's a particular quote that really disturbed me, but also kind of got to show you how vindictive and awful this glazer ownership are because there's one of these quotes that's coming out from united that the glazers weren't impressed 
when Sheikh Jassim first came out with an offer or was putting his hat into the ring to buy the club and he said something along the lines of oh he wants to restore United to the former glories and obviously that kind of quote on the timeline for the fans was super encouraging it kind of really made us hope that we were going to finally get you know over this period of darkness has kind of been you know fucking befolding on the club over time but I also had a feeling at the time considering how vindictive and weird the fucking Glazers are it wouldn't sit well with them and quite soon after it did come out a quote again from the Glazers also that they didn't like the stuff that Sheikh Jassim was saying on his side about the club and what he wanted to do and I think since that time you never really heard much more from him in terms of concrete plans what he wants to do because they didn't want to look like they were being embarrassed because it was also a weird way in their head they felt like it was um a criticism of their ownership so they didn't like how it sounded. So even though they were trying to sell it, they were trying to control the narrative of how they were selling it. They weren't selling it because they were bad owners or he did, did a horrible job. They were selling it because they just wanted the money, basically, kind of thing. And they didn't do a bad job. They didn't want everyone to kind of say that or lead to that sort of thinking in the press, which is absolutely crazy. But it does go to show just how fucking horrible they are as owners and just how unwilling they are, really, to admit that they've kind of done things wrong and rectify the issue which is essentially let go of the club and kind of move on. They don't want to. So obviously the news over the weekend, which is the one that hurt the most, was this, about six years in withdrawals from the protest, from the process, sorry. Um, the final bid that says here listed was 5.2 billion and had increased the final bid in April. Six was willing to invest $8 billion. Um, six years record is going to get the 25% that he wants in the club. And it keeps scrolling up here. I'm going to find the quote here that they were talking about it, but it was fairly depressing because it did go to show that the Glazers were never really intended on selling the club full, which kind of makes you think that maybe, 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 maybe um, they might be in some trouble for some sort of stock manipulation because they did give the impression they wanted to sell it in full. But if you were a savvy enough fan that's got your ear to the ground, you would have maybe had a bit of a squeaky bum time six months in. It's been a year process, right? Um, it's been too long. It's been too dragged out. I think you would already start getting nervous after six months and there was no indication that there was going to be a final, you know, um, a final line in the sand. They always kind of kept moving the goalposts and there was never really clarification on where we were in the process. So I think mostly they were always never going to sell it. They just wanted to have, to field as many bidders as possible. That didn't happen. And then they took the deal that kind of served their best interest going forward, basically. And if anything... As savvy businessmen as they are, they played the fans like a fiddle. They gave us hope, which essentially took the heat off them for a while. You didn't hear as many Glazers out chants because they were in the process of trying to sell the club. And then it kind of, you know, laid them kind made the, allowed them to kind of lay low. And then once the deal went through, they immediately started pushing out news about oh, the structure, the sport inside, blah, 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 blah. Nonsense, right? So it says here, um, there's gonna be a board meeting on Thursday coming up. Uh, in your script, um, is set to run the Man United sporting plans. It means a new co-owner will be able to decide on manager, director of football and similar positions. Of course, it doesn't matter because the people in charge who actually ratify a decision-making process are the ones that the problem really. As terrible and as average as John Murtaugh and Dara Fletcher are as a duo, it's not really their fault that we can't get rid of players or sign players. It's the fact that they have to go through so many hoops to get those things done is why we're in a position that we're in. But again, what do I know? You've got Jim, Sir Jim uh, Ratcliffe here looking like, you know, um, the snake that he is, unfortunately. Um, you've got more pictures here of Eric Ten Hag. Let me get a bit where it says Sheikh Jassim. Yeah, this is. So, again, we, we don't know if it's for facts, but I think there's some truth in this. This is Kershaw of Time Sport. It says, Qatar's Sheikh Jassim's promise to restore Man United to its quote-unquote former glories with a completely debt-free purchase did not amuse the Glazers, who saw the wording as implied criticism of their own tenure. So that own, that statement from Sheikh Jassim to give the fans hope and to sort of lay the groundwork and put his flag in the ground for what his tenure would have been like is up what kind of essentially led to the refusal from the Glazers to have him take over the club because it would have embarrassed them. And I think we've always had that sort of feeling when it came to director of football. We've always kind of felt as fans that all these names that were floated, all these ideas that were kind of banded around, never kind of got put through or never got implemented the way they should have got implemented because the owners didn't want to get shown up. 
They didn't want this new person to come in and do what they couldn't do in such a short space of time, which is probably would have happened, right? You get a new you get a new owner in. They all they, they organize the club in a way that would maximize our ability to be successful on the pitch, and most likely the changes would be felt, you know. Immediately, you could Im- immediately see the difference in profile of player we were signing, how quickly the squad was changing, blah, 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 blah. You could definitely see, okay, cool, there's something afoot here. So they didn't want that. So that's the thing that to me is the most depressing side of it is that we've got owners who have kind of, you know, essentially turned United into their own little thing that they could do whatever they want to it with without any real consideration to how the fans feel. And it kind of makes you feel hopeless. It makes you feel depressed, really. And if anything, like I said, it's a hope that kills you because this was the only solution that we had to really get United back to any semblance of former glories. That's why it's been so difficult for me to kind of finish the David Beckham documentary because it reminds you of just how great we once were. And again, it's not that we won everything and anything all the time. We just competed. It was fun to be a United fan because we were always pushing the top teams to the end. We probably didn't win enough Champions Leagues, to be honest, considering how you know well we performed in that competition, our squad, the managers, blah, 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 all that stuff. We didn't win enough, win enough trophies around that sort of time. So we kind of fell short a lot of times. Even if we say like FA Cups, I always think an FA Cup, our FA Cup record in general isn't as probably great as it probably should be as well. But it was a competition. It was the going for blow to blow with some of the greatest clubs in the country, some of the greatest players playing for those clubs and vice versa in Europe. And now we're seeing our club essentially still be there through name alone and through ability to sign and having our team the odd game winner. But it's not really anything. Like none United fan with sense really thinks that we're ever going to win the league. No United fan with sense really does think we're going to win the Champions League. It's all just a pipe dream, but you'd obviously rather prepare, sorry, you'd rather prefer to be in a Champions League than you would be in the Europa League, and you'd rather could prefer to compete for the league title than try to pay for top four. But even then, top four is probably still more valuable than fucking finishing, you know, first, especially for managers and shit. I don't know. It's all a fucking big mess. But in general, um, the disappointment is real, but again, not surprised. I think like my like other fans out there, I generally did start having really bad feelings for this as soon as it passed the six month stage. For me, I was like, okay, this is feeling like the standard sort of like Glazers approach to things where they sort of give fans a full sense of hope to basically get the steam off of them, the heat off of them. And then sooner rather than later, they'll end up doing what they always wanted to do, which is what fuck up the fans and disappoint them. And in the end, we're going to be disappointed. So Jim Ratcliffe isn't going to get what he thinks he's going to get for 25%. And we're going to be stuck in the same position once again. So I guess as a fan, you're led to sit there and think, what's what can you do to change it? You could obviously do stuff like boycotting the games, not actually going to the games, um, not actually going to the mega store. That's never going to happen because our fan base is just too big and people just love buying shit and don't really understand how to protest effectively. So that's never going to happen. So the only other option would be maybe on the pitch. If we were starting to like, you know, if we started free falling and we ended up getting relegated or close to relegating, that might actually force the Glazers to actually sell the club in full. You never know, because then it will be performing badly on the stock exchange. They won't be able to get the money that they want out of the club, blah, 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 blah. And they might want to cut their losses and move. But even then, I wouldn't be surprised if they like didn't refuse to kind of jump off that sinking ship. It wouldn't surprise me. It really wouldn't. So it really is a shame where we are at the moment. Not surprising, though. And I don't know, man. I really don't know. It's just It just kind of breaks my heart. I'm not going to lie, because United is just never, ever going to... I don't know if we're cursed... I don't know if this is kind of like the sort of like if this is what you're meant to get what once you're a club that has kind of won everything this is sort of like the natural place that you're meant to fall into where it's meant to be like 20 plus years of hurt um while all the clubs around you figure things out um I'm not too sure what's going on but for me it really does essentially take out all the emotion from me with the club you know I had a I had I wanted to have a feeling where I have I feel connected with the club again where maybe I'd feel like, oh, here's an opportunity to fall back in love with the club. But no more. That feeling has completely gone. Um, I don't really care for that shit anymore. And I'm just going to watch the games for watching the game's sake. But 
there's not really that connection that I once have with the club anymore. It doesn't exist. It kind of is what it kind of is, unfortunately. So I guess we have to see what happens going forward. But that's probably one of the most disappointing bits of news I've had to report in a while. And it really did bum me out when I heard it. But hey, what can you do? What can you do? So moving on to some other things to talk about here. Other things to talk about here. So over the past couple of weeks, I've been trying with very little success to try to get in contact with the people over at Hotbox who do one of the quote-unquote better parties in London that's sort of done under the premise of being invite only, behind closed doors, no pictures allowed, um, party that essentially is more catered towards the LGBTQ, queer side, gay side of the scene. But as I've told you in many previous episodes of the show, um, that side of our scene, especially in dance music, is the best when it comes to club culture, when it comes to music, when it comes to DJs, when it comes to vibes, ambiance, community, all that sort of stuff. It's fucking great. Once you get past the somewhat pretentious, hipstery, too cool for school side of things, usually, nine times out of ten actually, I've actually found some really safe, decent people from the times I've been to Budokai, I've been to Hull, I've been to Inferno, um, you know, even go to Dalton Superstores, you actually meet some sound, sound people um, for the most part, once you get past that initial kind of frostiness, right? But, so obviously there's there's a party here that you kind of, you know, you have to buy tickets for to go to, and they've got this system where you have to actually um, enter in the code to actually have the ability to actually purchase tickets. And But you obviously can contact them directly and they can basically tell you. So, I contacted him via DMs, no reply. No, first DMs, first, second email, no reply. And then when I finally did get speaking to somebody, the person was like, oh yeah, hey, thanks for reaching out. Good. Um, you know, give us a back. No, do you know somebody or a code who can recommend? Something along that lines, right? And obviously I'm a solo raver. I don't know any of these people, right? And I don't really try to like build community or relationships with people. I just go to things I like to go to and kind of duck out. That's kind of how I've dealt with all things, whether it's going to Bergheim, whether it's going to fucking smaller underground type events. I'm not really one that kind of gets into the whole, you know, trying to find friends and this sort of stuff. I might add the other people here on Instagram, but I'm not going to use you as a name to kind of get in at a place. That's f- losery stuff for me, in my opinion. And it's, again, Sony is just a part. It's not that deep. So I thought, hey, let me just add a bit of spiel here about knowing one of the people involved with running Hotbox, right? A person called Be- Becky Strook. And I thought, hey, I've, I've seen this person play at Fold. I've seen them play at Inferno. I'm very familiar with their sets. I've listened to some of their mixes online, read some of their interviews. I'm, I know who this person is. So I kind of read that stuff. And I was thinking to myself when I was writing it on my DMs, why am I doing this? I feel like an entry-level position or somewhere and they start asking you questions like oh go on our website and tell us five things you would fix about the site to make it more streamlined give us ideas on how we can improve our refunding process all this sort of stuff you're like hold on i don't work for you why am i having to do work for you to get a job like this is ridiculous right like it doesn't make any sense what incentive do i have to do this and why would i do it for free just to benefit you, just so I can show you that I know what I'm doing. There should be other ways to get around that, like maybe specific tasks that you do in a day, but recommending things to you and wanting to write a business plan or one page for you is just absolutely insane. So I didn't understand that, but I thought, you know what? For once in my life, because usually when I get those type of replies from jobs, I'll do this, do that. I just like, you know what? I'm not going to bother. I just kind of ignore it, center bin and kind of keep it moving. But for the one time I left, you know what? Let me just try and do what the normal person would do and try and flipping fill out this flipping thing, reply how maybe I think they want me to reply or maybe, you know, essentially prove that I get what they're about and shit, which is insane, really, to be honest, because I could have said anything really and truly. There's no real understanding or gauge on who I am as a person based on some of the words I might be able to say on the social media and shit. But anyway, regardless, we let it lie. So I went to say that I did it. And since I sent them that message, I think like two or three weeks ago, I've not seen a flipping reply. Not one reply I've seen since that time. And the funny thing about it is that I first thought I got left on scene. They haven't even opened my message. And to me, it's one of two things. It's a bad thing and a good thing. It's a bad thing because I think it kind of displays how how unfortunately the London scene just isn't conducive to somebody trying to get involved and do their thing especially if they're not somebody that's 
a part of the LGBTQ queer scene in that side of things. Like if you don't identify a certain way in this country, in this scene, unfortunately, you just don't get the same amount of welcome, welcoming that you probably should be getting. Because they they always say about being in an inclusive space, about being welcoming to all different types of people, promoting diversity, but they want only a certain type of diversity. If you're not gay, if you're not queer, if you don't present a certain way, they don't want you in the scene. And for some reason, they think if you're not those things and you maybe describe yourself as hetero or cis, that most likely you have certain beliefs that don't align to theirs automatically. They can't be somebody that could come in, that could represent or you know present the way that I present and not be aligned with what they do. They'd have to be an op. They have to be somebody that has to be kept apart or kept on the outside, which is odd because like I said, I'm a little bit of a lone soldier. Most of the raves and stuff that I go to, I usually go to on my own. I found out about these things because I'm interested in the music, because I give a fuck is why I fucking know about this sort of stuff. I'm sure most people who just kind of consume what they consume with the scene based on what they're into um, or just on the surface level probably don't know about the things that I know about because they don't really care, right? But I obviously care to a level to know about these smaller operations and shit. So you'd think that be enough right to get me into the door but no but then again on the flip side it's also a good thing similar to like the skateboarding scene um kind of at the moment one of the reasons why it never really went as corny as you know rollerblading and whatever it may be called and bmxing is because from the it's from the from the from the fucking from the start of things if i remember correctly They've always been incredibly possessive and selective and guarded about the scene when it comes to skateboarding compared to BMX, compared to fucking rollerblading. It's always been very, very sort of like closed, clicky, vibe checky, all that sort of stuff. I'm sure most of you who've been to skate shops over the world, especially around the world, especially skate your own shops can attest to feeling vibed out by your local skate store, by your scene, by people associated with it and blah, 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 blah. It's sort of like the, the kind of route of passage to kind of go through in order to kind of feel welcomed in the scene. It can be sometimes, um, it can be sometimes uh, humiliating, uh, you know, just kind of, it can make you feel like shit, but sometimes it does lead to good results because essentially however many years on from skateboarding being invented, it's now still a little bit of a underground um subculture type of thing right it's still not as commodified and sold out as other things or no it's not sold out obviously because it's an olympics but it's just not as like cringy and corny as stuff like bmx and rollerblading and even sometimes even stuff like fixed gear and stuff it's got to a point where you know you can get probably fixed gear bikes on fucking amazon so it's obviously going to be crazy but i feel like their refusal to engage with me and be a little bit kind of hands you know to keep me at hands distance turn the blind eye ignore me and shit is also a reason why the party is proper successful because there's such hoops to jump through to get in you have to kind of beg and plead obviously i'm not going to beg and plead i sent two messages I'm not sending anyone again so whatever it kind of is what it is i'm not taking it personally but it is kind of interesting to see the whole diversity thing the whole welcoming people into the scene sort of thing isn't really true especially once you get into the underground side of things, they really are selective about who they invite. It probably is way more discriminatory than going to a Soho club because you could actually buy your way into those kind of clubs and get in there if you've got enough money, if you've got enough contacts. But in these type of places, they judge you on your appearance. Like, I might as well just be a white dude. I might as well just be like a standard white techno dude with a bald head that wears all black. Really, I might as well look like Richie Horton because to these guys, unless I've got nail polish, unless I put lipstick on, unless I color my hair a certain way, unless I'm wearing a harness, all these type of things, I'm not a part of their community or crowd, which is interesting because like I said, I'm one of the people I feel like I go out of my way to try to engage and take part in these type of parties that are not especially for me, but just to get an understanding of the music and of the scene and to vibe with people other than people that look like myself like i go out of my way to do that sort of thing so you'd imagine that sort of enthusiasm that sort of like commitment to get in on the ground level because i'm a big believer in actually going to experience things with your own eyes and ears and your feet and not just agreeing with what someone else says about the place even if it's good or bad you'd think that'd go a long way to kind of you know um to kind of get in a position where i can maybe enter the type of places but it doesn't um so that also brought me neatly on to this sort of like headline that I saw on RA where it said Saffron opens applications to a 
2023 to 2024 development program. The subtext is um, Bristol based nonprofit will work with four black women, trans, non-binary music creators on the eight month program. And this immediately made me think, this is basically my pecking order when it comes to dance music. As a straight black dude, I essentially am just above a white straight dude. Just because I'm black, and just because I come from a quote-unquote, you know, minority community or whatever it may be, I'm still just looked at as a hetero, cisgendered, basic ass bitch guy um, that's just above the white dudes. That's essentially how they kind of look at me, which is actually interesting. Because in my head, when I go into dance music, I always had this idea or nightlife or wherever that maybe in a really fanciful and really naive and really wishful way of thinking we were trying to create our own versions of utopia via the lens of nightlife because essentially with nightlife you could essentially look at it as a way of getting into like urban planning as a way of getting into um you know as a way of kind of having the ability to sort of create the community that you would want to see in the world on mass being a promoter, being a party organizer, being a DJ, right? You get to experience all these different people from all these different parts of the world because you're playing music. You get to also be a part of different people from around the world because you're on the dance floor. All these type of things, right? You would imagine, that's what I always thought. Hey, let's create this, I wouldn't say safe space, but let's just create a version of what we'd want to see in the world. And you kind of put that stuff out there. But you put it out there under the guise of like, as long as you're cool, as long as you love the music, as long as you know what, know what this party is about, you're down and you're welcome in our club, especially if we've got space for you. That's what you'd think it would be. But over time, we've got to the point where, and I think I've always had this issue myself, is like, there's a lot of like negative reactions and feelings around certain people in other scenes. Like people, you know, have a lot of rude things to say about people that go to tech house parties, people that go to fucking bait commercial things like um, Tomorrowland, bloody blah, 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 blah. And I think that negative feeling around people who choose other types of music or other types of clubs to go to or festivals has led to the thing that we're in now at the moment with me not hearing back from Hotbox, where essentially these places are more so a safe haven and a sort of like refuge for the people that don't want to go to those parties and don't want those people from those parties to come to their space. So we all have these little cliques and clubs where we sort of like band around and make sure that we only are around people that look and act like us and have the same opinions as us which is, to me is fucking crazy because the world at large doesn't exist like that and most likely especially if you go to the really inclusive clubs that strive to just have as many people from all over the world as possible on the dance floor you're going to get a very wide variety of opinions on various different things concerning the world and that's what you want because in the, the day it's just the music you want everybody to be connected under this idea of accepting each other for who we are and also just enjoying the music all the other stuff that happens on the outside that's super divisive that kind of separates us and bloody blah 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 that's super judgmental you throw that away that's what you'd hope it would be like but it's not actually like that it's actually way more discriminatory than a regular club like i said you could actually go you could actually probably get into a really fancy parisian sort of like you know upscale very you know up its own ass um velvet rope type of club easier than some of these clubs that exist in the what i'd like to deem it as the quote-unquote alternative sort of like side of things that's obviously the most interesting side that's the only reason why also i'm interested to go because it's a sick party i read about it being a sick party people post good reviews about it online and that's everything too that's really annoying you talk about this like this party has been you know they have interviews on big sites and shit they get featured new places then when a random person that would look at that sort of stuff which i haven't because i've seen it beforehand but imagine you just annoy me and you read a record, you read an article about Hotbox on DJ Mag, on RA, on Mix Mag, or any other sites that exist out there, and now you want to go, all of a sudden now what? You have to send them a picture of yourself dressed up in latex and fishnets for them to agree to go. It doesn't make any sense. Like, I'm not judging people that wear that sort of stuff and do that sort of thing. To me, it's interesting and I like it. It's not for me personally. But even if I did identify as these guys identify, but because I don't present in a certain way, I wouldn't be able to get in. You know, that's a really crazy thing about it and i remember that shift happening a lot in berlin where 
when I went to Berlin in the past, you'd have people at the door asking you questions about the lineup and about, do you know this is a gay space? You know, this is a gay part, like all these type of things, right? To kind of clock your vibe and how you respond. Nowadays, you go there and you can tell they're trying to figure out if you're queer or if you're gay. Instead of asking you, hey, do you know about the DJ? Because you could essentially, I could go and, I could see, for instance, like a good example is Cormac, right? One of my favorite disco DJs. He usually plays at a lot of really gay gay events, basically. LGBTQ, Q, Q, LGBTQ plus queer events and whatnot, right? And I like some of these parties I'll go to. Some of them aren't the greatest. Some of them are, are good. But I mainly go to see Cormac play. And I'll go there. I'll be respectful of the space. I'll do my own thing. I'll dance, have a good time. And I'm bouncing. But I'm there to see Cormac. I'm there to see the beautiful varied people from all around the world um displaying themselves in cool interesting way the crazy dancers the fucking production all that sort of stuff i'm there to see but i'm mainly there to see the dj so in the past you'd hear the person at the door say to you hey do you know what this rave's about yes i do do you also know that this is the da -da, who you had to see you name the person and then from then on they can make a decision on if they want to let you in or not but nowadays i honestly do feel like at the door they are trying to ascertain your sexuality so that they can decide to let you in or not and if you're not super um femme presenting you're probably not going to get in or queer but they're not gonna, that's that's a real harsh reality of it and it's kind of sad i'm not gonna lie because i think on the same token if these same people were to go to like percolate or what's that what's that one called um oh i forgot the name of it but another big fucking house or tech house event where there's a lot of kind of you know what you deem to be like you know normie essex type people most likely they'd get the same looks that i would get being a straight presenting male in these sort of spaces too i understand it but i just think it's the it's the owner's responsibility on the owners to provide a space where everybody feels welcomed as long as it's shown interest in the scene and in the music because that's what it's all about at the end will this person make other people in the room feel unsafe will the person actually like the music will they be a good addition to the community all these sort of things what you should really kind of go through your head but for some reason these guys and girls they don't think that way um and they obviously think in a way like hey you don't present a certain way we're going to judge you based on some words you said on a dm they didn't really sound good to us so we're going to kind of let it go and let go there's no way but then the other side again part of me also thinks you know what i actually rate them for being so um hands you know keep keep back type of thing because that type of approach will probably go a long way to save them and to sort of like put in a position where they don't have a rave that dies because a bunch of normies jump in because maybe there's a maybe there is a a reason to say if i get interested in the part that you're doing and you're from the queer lgbtq side of things maybe if people like me start getting interested in the club or in the party that you do maybe it's a bad thing maybe people could say that and there is some sort of maybe validity in it right if kind of people that don't really belong to your community start to get interested maybe that's a sign that you're getting too big too quickly and you might end up being horse meat disco right you might end up being whatever else commercial type of gay event that kind of exists out there so i do understand their um sort of like you know unwillingness or nerves to uh, nervousness to kind of open the doors up to people who maybe don't identify with their community but i think for myself being a consummate kind of nightlife person and a bit of an addict for raves and shit it's annoying you know what i mean because you want to be a part of something you want to be you want to see what it's like in the, on the inside and then they're saying nah because you don't present a certain way kind of is what it is i guess but i'm interested to know if i ever did a course or a program that was geared towards getting more black straight men into techno or into house music or into nightlife culture or into dance music how would that go down if you have to, if you were to do like a development program for black male straight techno djs or house djs whatever would people have the same reaction that they have to this sort of stuff when it kind of you know is under the guise of uh black women trans and non-binary people i wonder if that's the case because i think all of these things don't really address the issues because i feel like to me the issues are more so hey why are all these big clubs all these big spaces always booking the same people why aren't they being a little bit more adventurous in who they pick? Why aren't they giving 
more up and coming promoters a chance to put nights on by maybe lowering the price of admission from terms of hiring in terms of deposit all these type of things that may be affecting kind of grassroots underground diy promoters from being able to put their parties on at the scale that some of these other players are doing it why aren't djs also getting involved at that kind of grassroots level why aren't there programs or resident dj sort of things that existed in the past that would allow somebody to sort of learn on the job and kind of get an understanding of how to play in front of a crowd so these are the things that actually are the root cause of the imbalance we have in the scene right and obviously the refusal of people at the top to sort of like step aside which is understandable because it's a sick job why would you step aside if you don't need to but all of that stuff kind of contributes way more to what's going on which is why a lot of these people took things in their own hands and just like running their own parties but they're essentially still repeating the same mistakes of the other dudes who they try to replace because they're still booking the same like if, if you look at some of the most popular lgbtq queer non-binary parties that exist out there they all still book the same 10 to 20 people really and truly all the names kind of rotate so they haven't really changed if you think about it it hasn't really really changed which is the really sad thing about it they're sort of repeating the same mistakes but at a really small scale with a smaller group of people and then obviously they're also trying to cl keep the doors closed from the hordes of people that want to come in because the party is also getting to where it's getting to so i understand the fucking you know the the, the kind of tension that exists there but i just think it's super funny to see these people and parties be like nah although you're black and you should be included in this because we want to see more people like yourself on the dance floor because you happen to be straight nah we can't do this unfortunately you're not part of our gang so that's the only thing that's really upsetting about it um again you know not not, not too surprising maybe i shouldn't be too upset about it because like i said maybe it's a good thing that they are so normy kind of um resistant and maybe that's going to lead to them surviving in the long term because one of the reasons that i've or one of the things i've been fascinated by has been the success of some of these gay lgbtq queer um, non-binary parties because essentially they get to a point where people immediately find out oh these are where the good parties at maybe some of the straight boys realize oh shit all the girls go here or maybe some of the girls think oh my god wow this is a safe place i can go to i can wear a cute outfit and not be harassed all these good things happen but what it leads to in the end it leads to the party getting too bait, too popular, and it loses its essence over time. So the success of the club can sometimes be its downfall, similar to fucking Suicide 54, right? You watch Suicide 54 documentary, and quite literally, over this period of time, it went from being a club for the people to being a club for the elites. And then the people complain, it gets rowdy outside, trouble ensues, and then that leads to it eventually closing down. So the success of the club, and the refusal of the owners to sort of like acquiesce and no, the, the refusal of the owners to sort of service the fans that help to build it and kind of keep them at its core and shift its focus to celebrities or normies, whoever it might be, led to that club shutting down. Maybe it would have always shut down because of the dodgy nature of business the owners were involved in in terms of organized crime and drug dealing and whatnot. But I feel like that type of story is definitely a cautionary one. If you've watched it before, it's a really good documentary on 54. The, the latest one that basically came out. I watched it a couple of times. I watched it obviously when it came out of the cinema. And then of course, also watched it online and shit. And that is what I kind of got from it. And I think you've seen it a lot over the time, especially with certain festivals and shit, um, certain parties, certain promoters. If you just let it, see, if you let it get too popular, it can lose its essence. And then in the actuality, it kind of, you know, suffers and the people that actually go there feel like it's not really, you know, responding or answering to them in any very sort of meaningful way. So it's upsetting, it's sad, but it kind of is what it is. And I guess I'll have to find something else to go to. Wah, wah, wah. Anyways, moving on, moving on, moving on. So there's actually been some developments regarding the one who's known as Kanye West, who now goes by Ye. He's putting on a pretty interesting performance in Italy on October 27th. Now, I've heard it could be scrapped. I've heard there's maybe some new locations popping. But in general, the idea of Kanye performing a new album, collaborative one he's got with Ty Dolla Sign, is going to happen in Italy at some point this month, which is quite incredible. And to be fair, it's one of the most interesting parts of Ye. I've always enjoyed his activations. So when it comes to marketing his products, whether it's the listening sessions, whether it's basically the live shows. I've liked the fact that he uses these IRL events 
to actually tell a story and to sort of display his artistry and his creativity and just how unique he is in that space because there's no one really out there who's doing it at the level and scale that Ye does it and I love the random location somewhat random I guess maybe he's got partners out there in Italy he's working with and the fact that he um goes out of his way to create these amazing immersive really interesting live experiences for people to watch to live stream online all this sort of good stuff so it's pretty sick so this is courtesy of billboard the article says kanye and his team are working to produce a concert in italy to promote the rapper's up and coming collaborative album with ty dollar sign west who now goes by yay um, is scheduled to perform a new album alongside ty dollar sign an undisclosed location in italy on october 27th with tickets going on sale as early as sunday and i find it interesting too because these events are usually a good barometer of just where Ye is in the current culture because a lot of people out there that have a lot of things to say about Ye, a lot of things to say about his anti-semitism tour that he went on that was absolutely insane a lot of things to say about his kind of you know love and infatuation with donald trump his kind of rejection of blm and all this sort of stuff online um his love for all these other kind of right wing sort of like platforms that people generally don't really like online especially people that kind of come from his community side of things who maybe describe themselves as more left-leaning i think these listing events or these fashion shows are really good litmus test for where these guys morals and principles actually stand because once you get that invite because again imagine i'd imagine the run up to the 27th you're going to see loads of industry people posting loads of cryptic things about them going to italy randomly in october they'll be posting you know maybe their boarding passes looking out of a window of a plane tagging the location at the airport they'll do all these dumb things so everybody will feel like they're being left out and they're not involved in the court thing because they're not in italy and everybody obviously that got the invite will feel privileged that they got the invite to go to spring then all the people have got the invite to go to or maybe they miss out on tickets so if you ever want to see why Kanye is the way he is apart from himself being the way he is I think you see it a lot with the amount of people he has around him that sort of turn a blind eye to the quote-unquote fuck shit that he does and because they just want to be associated with him and how influential he is in that regard so do prepare to see a lot of people who are maybe talking a lot of shit about some of Kanye's remarks around you know the Jewish people and whatnot and now suddenly they're going to be okay with going and hanging out with him in Italy because it's going to really look good on a social media profile whatever we digress billboard italia previously reported that the show will be held at the rcf arena formerly known as the campo vaio or the campo volo um, in regina emilia in reggio emilia but the location hasn't been confirmed by west's group the gathering is expected to draw up to 100,000 people. A representative of the West has declined Billboard's request or comment. Billboard has also reached out for reps to tad dollar sign. So this event has been done within a month's notice, right? In the middle of Italy, random location, not even Milan, not even fucking all the bait Rome, all these bait cities. It's kind of done a little bit on the outskirts and they're expecting 100,000 people. That just goes to show you the pure and appeal and the absolute bona fide star power that is yeah, in it. That he's able to get 100,000 fans to come and see him in Italy. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a little bit different with the, with the American performance. I feel like most American rappers and artists, um, even the ones that some people would deem to be average, they would most likely sell out quite a few venues here because they don't come a lot, right? Especially in mainland Europe. Maybe in the UK it's different, but I think generally a lot of the artists in America who don't generally come to Europe often will probably perform a lot better in terms of ticket sales because, you know, it's probably the only chance you're going to be able to see um, Ye performing in Italy maybe within the next 10 years or so, right? So you're going to take advantage of it. And with it being in Italy, a lot of people from all parts of Europe could easily get there by train because the train system in Europe is fucking brilliant. They could get there by plane, which is usually quite cost-effective also. So there's no shortage of people from all around Europe and the world who would fly to Italy to see him. And just as an experience, it might be a bit cool to see him in such a place where you're not used to seeing him as opposed to all the other bait places and shit. So it only makes a lot of sense, but still 100,000 people for an event that's only been given a month's head up heads up is crazy because people are cancelling dates for arena tours in america that they've specked out a year in advance so this just goes to show that yeah he's on another level a representative for west declined billboard's request for comment 
Billboard also reached out for Ty Dolla Sign reps, but he didn't, I guess, didn't reply to. Wes's forthcoming performance would allow the rapper and fashion mogul's surprise appearance at, um, sorry, Wes's forthcoming performance would follow the rapper's fashion mogul's surprise appearance at Travis Scott's Circus Maximus concert in Rome on August 7th. He also has been photographed in various Italian cities in recent months alongside his wife, Bianca Sanzori. Rumours about the possible West concert in Italy began in early October when RCF Arena started the construction of a large stage with a show that's scheduled for October 13th, according to local news. Plans fell through when the building couldn't obtain the necessary permits to build a stage by mid-October. Some fans have speculated the concert would be listening party for West and Tyler Dollar Science's new album. In recent weeks, West has been spotted near recording studios in Milan. West and Tidal Sign are currently shopping for partners to distribute the forthcoming collaborative project. Sources told Billboard the new set is originally scheduled to release um, on Friday the 13th, but it's been pushed back and expected to arrive the coming weeks. Last time West and Tidal Sign released a collaborative um, Junior Part 2 on Ye's 2001 album, Dunder. Before that, they worked together on Tidal Sign's Ego Death and West's Everything We Need, Real Friends, and Only One 2014. So, so it's developing. So, so far, we've got it spec'd out for the 27th i'm eager to see what it's going to look like most likely they're going to live stream it also so it's going to be really fun to sort of watch from the outside going in but again another reminder so why what yay is the way he is is because nothing really impacts him in the real world people say what they want to say online about his behavior but when it comes to actual fans in the real world irl they don't care about that sort of stuff and they love the music because the music is so undeniable and much like i said about doja cat i feel like when it comes to artistry as long as the work is of a level that can't be replicated by others, people are willing to part with a lot of you, personality-wise. You can be a very unpleasant person and be able to get away with murder if the work is just too undeniable and there's no one else that could do the things that you do. And I think the danger with Doja Cat, unfortunately, is that her music just isn't good enough to justify putting up with some of the things that she says and does online for attention. It just gets too too annoying. I mean, she kind of turns off a lot of people to a point where like you know what i'm i'm okay not listening to you which might be the plan all along because i thought about it the other day that actually might be the plan maybe she doesn't really like being as famous as she is and she purposely tries to piss off her fans get them to not be fans of her anymore by telling them that she doesn't love them and shit and to leave her alone in the hopes that her fan base will dwindle so she can go back to being a somewhat normal artist and not have the expectation of like a big potential megastar that she obviously is so maybe that's the case but i think at the heart of it still for me it's just the music if the music is so good that it, it just can excuse your behavior then you're onto a winning line and i think we've obviously seen that with um yay and obviously we see it to some respects to some respects to some respects um we see that a little bit with morrissey kind of the work was really good when he was in smiths and some of his earlier albums when he went solo uh but since then he's works have kind of gone down the you know they've kind of gone downhill and his attitude isn't the greatest and maybe some of the things that he say people don't really ad- like too tough so that's another example of where it can go for you so i guess on doja cat side of things she's got two paths ahead of her she could end up like yay or she could end up like morrissey you have to decide one or the other but either way eager to see what yay does when he goes out to italy and all that malarkey i wonder if the italy thing is to do with his wife because his wife's name does sound quite italian but I think she's from Australia. Why? I don't know if she speaks Italian. I'm not sure if she has just Italian ancestry and she has no idea about her, you know, about her roots in terms of speaking a language. But either way, I like the fact that they're living in Europe and sort of like keeping a low profile. And um, I think one of the saving things and good things about living in Europe, you'd imagine, like living in parts of Asia, is that the paparazzi just isn't as crazy as it is in the States. I think if you ask most celebrities, they'd probably be okay with having random fans come up to me asking for pictures and autographs then having paparazzi literally following you around because the fan interactions are just when you get out of the car or you're in a public space the paparazzi are literally following you from every place that you go door to door door to door so i can definitely get why um these people prefer to go in vacation those places and like i said before i think yeah he's just unique because he's got fuck you money and he does fuck you type things he says fuck you he talks about dicey topics um and he just keeps on going and i love like, all that about him i really really do so moving on let's talk a little bit about fucking tommy fury versus ksi that whole entire card was such a waste of time i've never been so happy to not pay for something than i did then honestly 
it sold right. I think it was sold as a pay per view or something. But there's no way that card was worth the price of admission. Whether it was entry into the place to watch it, whether it was buying the 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 ability to stream it online on the zone, not worth it whatsoever. The fights were garbage. The spectacle was garbage. And if anything, it kind of reminded me or gave me a new appreciation for professionals. I think in our heads, a lot of us probably think, oh yeah, this sort of boxing stuff is good when it's like amateurs just learning on the job, figuring out as they go along, blah, 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 blah. Some of the stories can be inspiring. But the truth of it is, seeing people that can't really fight too well, trying to scrap in a ring, might be one of the top 10 things that I don't want to ever repeat again. It's just awful. It kind of re reminds me of like a really bad version of like white collar boxing that you sometimes get in your local gym and shit where they just invite randoms to come and just slog each other out with helmets on and shit, right? It's just not that great. And the issue for me was on both on both big fights, the Tommy Fury versus KSI and the Dylan Daniels versus Logan Paul, you had two people, two fights, sorry, where there's a lot of like animosity between two both camps. They went to rip each other's heads off, right? They were really going for it, get, selling the, the fight before, um, saying a lot of personal things, really revving themselves up. And obviously the fans also, to go in there and perform, go in there and put the beats on somebody, right? Knock them out, give them a good teaching, whatever it may be. Didn't happen. Both fights didn't happen. You saw Tommy Fury, who's meant to be the more seasoned boxer. He's meant to be the person that's actually trying to pursue a career in professional boxing get into the ring with KSI, a guy that's only learned to box in the last few years, and look very average. That's the thing that I'd be concerned about if I was Tommy Fury. You go into the ring with KSI, and some people out there are saying KSI was robbed. I don't actually agree. I think if you actually watch the fight back, you'll see a lot of punches that he was throwing. Although they looked like they connected, they didn't. Um, and he didn't really get a lot. He didn't really get the necessary damage needed to win that fight. I thought Tommy Fury did a lot more better work in the clench um, by kind of, you know, basically inflicting damage, hitting uh, KSI, even though his face didn't look too lumped up. I just think in the balance of punches landed, probably Tommy Fury, I'd imagine, probably eclipsed KSI. But overall, the quality of the fight was disgusting. You had KSI with this weird karate type stance where he kept throwing his hands in the air, trying to leap in with a left and a right which to me felt very predictable. Um, it felt like if the person fighting him had a little bit better timing, wanted to take a risk, could have probably caught him as he was flying in the way he did. And then towards the end of the fight itself, when it started to get into four rounds plus, they started to get more desperate and the standard started to completely go. But one of the things that annoyed me the most is what I got here on screen was the hugging. As soon as KSI threw that leading left jab, leaning jump left jab and then a overhand right that he always kind of goes for his signature punches, um, Tommy Fury would immediately duck because it was quite telegraphed and then clench and then he'd be stuck in that clench forever. The referee would have to break them up a million times. I think Tommy Fury got a point. Exactly. Think about this. Tommy Fury got a point deducted for punching KSI behind the head, which is illegal during the clench. And then um, in the end, he still won by unanimous decision, which is absolutely crazy. But the fight itself was terrible and I wasn't that annoyed about who won. Um, if anything, you could have made it a draw if you wanted to, but it was legitimately one of the most horrendous fights to watch that I've ever watched in my entire life. Really, really was one of the horrendous ones. And I think the biggest loser to come out of this is definitely Tommy Fury. If people say Anthony Joshua's overrated, I don't know what you say about this guy because that was very surprising how bad he looked in there. Because I think if you're a professional or if you're trying to be a pro, you look at these fights with the uh, YouTube as an opportunity to remind people these are the levels. Hey, I know you can run. I know you can hit a heavy bag. You're good with mitts. But usually people would say getting into these type of skirmishes, these type of fights with YouTubers should be the real test because people can see, okay, concretely, how much better this pro or aspiring pro is than somebody that happens to be a decent fighter in their local neighborhood. You know what I mean? That's why it should be. But what do I know when it comes to this sort of stuff? What do I know? I thought KSI did a fairly decent job given the size of the opponent he was fighting, um, the size of the challenge available. But number one, he has to carve those dreads. That receding headline is so crazy. Like he legitimately looks like his dreads are starting from the back of his head, but he's just got a really, really long and crazy foreline. Um, the fighting stance thing, I'm not really too sure I'm fond of that kind of like boxing karate stance and shit that he's got on throwing his hands in the air. And I just think the combination that he was throwing, the combinations he was throwing were just too predictable. Um, 
too repetitive and just didn't do what they maybe he wanted them to do. But overall, absolutely horrendous fight. Didn't really love it in any way, shape or form. Wasn't that bothered about who won and who didn't win. And just for in general, um, it was a very bad advertisement for YouTuber boxing. Really, really bad, to be honest. I honestly do think so. But one of the worst ones had to be Dylan Dennis versus Logan Paul. That might be one of the biggest waste of times I've ever seen in my entire life. That legitimately made me angry to the point where I just shut the laptop down. I don't think I even saw who actually got announced as a winner of the fight. I shut the laptop down and saw clips online, but it absolutely frustrated me that I had to stay up late to watch that shit um, because it was absolute garbage. And more so, again, garbage on Logan Paul's side of things because Dylan Dennis has been doing what he's been doing online to promote the fight by essentially harassing, quote-unquote, and bullying his wife to be Nina. Um, and you'd imagine with Logan Paul's obvious negative feelings around Dylan Dennis, his insistence that he was going to punish him, he was going to brutalise him, knock it, all these things, he had all the incentive in the world to try and fuck Logan up. Sorry, and fuck Dylan Dennis up. Every intention. He had all the resources needed for him to go and absolutely mess Dylan Dennis up, and he didn't. He hardly landed any real crazy punches, um, Dylan Dennis was really guarded up really well the entire time. He was kind of, you know, dead and running out of gas towards the end, Logan Paul, even though he didn't really do much. It was a really strange performance overall. Absolutely strange. I don't even understand what was going on. Everything was happening at once, but nothing was happening at the same time. The quality of the fight was absolutely garbage. You saw flipping, what's his face? Dylan Dennis at one point end up in this weird fucking position of the floor where he was basically inviting um logan paul into his guard so he could i don't know take his back or choke him out i don't know what was going on there and then right at the end of the fight uh, when everything goes off he then tried to flip and punch logan i think as they were kind of split it up and then all hell ensued and those people from both teams jumped into the ring to stop the flipping fight in melee so it was a pretty crazy affair overall but the quality of the performances were terrible and another reminder as to why all of these kind of fights, especially if you watch actual fighting, are worthless because the people fighting in them don't know what actual pain is like. They don't actually know what, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. It's just, it's just not a good quality product. It really isn't. Like, there's something about mixing up these fight cards with actual professional boxers that actually might make a difference, maybe. But even that isn't guaranteed because I don't know if a professional boxer would want to be associated with a card where you know, someone like a, uh, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, maybe the professional want to stay with the professional side of things, maybe the clout isn't worth it, but what I know that isn't worth it is seeing these guys get in the ring and do that abject performance, and Dylan Dennis as well has to definitely hold that L, all that smack talk he was talking about, beating up Paul, Logan Paul, and giving them the business, and you can't do this to me, all the harassing, it's kind of counted for nothing, because he didn't really show anything there, he barely landed any punches, he was covering up most of the time, just absorbing that damage, which might have been his plan all along, but it was a very hard thing to watch in real time, I'm not going to lie, very, very, very difficult to watch, and I'm kind of glad that I didn't pay for it, I'm kind of glad I didn't go, even though I did really want to go, because what a shocking, 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 shocking state of affairs, that I'm just, I don't know, there's nothing more you can say really, when it comes to the sort of things, like there's honestly nothing more that needs to be said, that could be said, that would make it make sense. If it isn't anything that would make it make sense, because I was just sat there in disbelief thinking, this is what YouTuber boxing is. This is what we got to. We got to this level where these guys are meant to be at the top, the apex predators of that group, and they look very average. So you have to wonder, the people that do lose to them, they probably have to feel really bad about those losses because these guys are fucking terrible. And again, isn't their fault? I think it's really difficult probably to learn how to box in your you know, teenage, late teenage years, early 20s and shit, to suddenly go from being somebody that's not violent, not fighting people to suddenly go and choking their heads off is really difficult. Of course it is. But um, that necessary skill developing over time is super important because what you do get if you don't develop over time is what we saw, <laughs> is what we saw in that YouTuber's boxing thing because that was absolutely trash. Anyway, moving on. So the internet has decided to ragdoll or to, you know, tease... Tremaine Emery again. It seems like ever since that whole Supreme thing went down with him wanting, um, you know, slave representation or slave 
slavery depictor no art that came from slavery whatever you want to call it right he wanted basically guys that look like they've been whipped and chained and hung and all this sort of stuff to be on his t-shirts as he's working at supreme as a creative director right that was one of his fucking things he was going for it didn't work out i covered the downfall of it and what led to it bloody blah, blah blah i'm not gonna go over it again but it seems like every other week there's a reminder on the timeline of why maybe some people have been you know, black Twitter and other parts of social media, maybe on the fashion side of things, aren't really the biggest fans of Ye. Of Ye, of Tremaine, sorry. What do call him Ye for? And he's getting it again now, recently, because pictures came out of his wedding. Um, he, got, well, he got, I guess, married to somebody called a Andy um, that happened over the weekend. So congratulations to Tremaine Emery. And people were basically commenting when they saw the picture splayed over social media, as this person says in the caption, I know that it ain't who I think it is. Never mind, let me mind my business. And obviously everybody in the comments sort of like, you know, added their two cents into it. Um, one person says, ha ha, just like you. Another one says, the coonery is crazy. Another one says, Barry won't say nothing about yay though. Um, it's always the dudes who look like African studies professors, fetishizing the pro-blackness and not actually living it is crazy. Um, blah, 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 blah. And the other comment I heard, which is really mean, was like, oh, it doesn't matter because Tremaine's ugly anyway. Why are people acting as if, why are black women on Twitter acting as if they date him? He's the kind of guy that would date white girls because black girls think he's ugly, which is kind of a crazy thing to say. Very, very mean. But you see a lot of people being mean online because I guess they don't really like his positions that he had regarding um, some of the choices that he was putting together or some of the things he wanted to put together when he said Supreme. Anyway, so we're going to go through some of the bits and pieces. But for me, the most concerning part for me was the actual clip of it, of him of him walking out of the courthouse i'm guessing it was or the wed or the registry where it looks like he's suffering he's actually struggling to walk it looks like he permanently has to walk with it. it looks like he permanently has to sorry walk with a cane by all accounts every lower the sound of it it looks like he always has to walk with a cane as he's walking away and he's really struggling to walk like for real not even like he's got a slight limp his legs aren't really working the way they used to work he's kind of got this odd sort of like clumping walking pattern so that aneurysm he suffered from has really negatively affected him so god bless this guy hope he does get a speedy recovery very very soon and he's back to full health because that's pretty sad to see man the guy is super young still he's in his 40s i think for him to be in a position where he's not unable to walk the way he used to walk is really really tragic i'm not gonna lie like he's actually struggling to walk do you know what I mean? he's got this really like clumpy way of walking at least he's still got his legs so that's pretty good but that's the only sad thing about it so people are obviously commenting on that online and being all whatever odd about it but he looks happy they're in love they had the wedding well done to them right everything was good well not so much because some of the quotes from people online have been kind of ravaged so i'm going to kind of go through a few of them and then obviously give you my comment at the end um one of the quotes here says uh we can sorry yeah, we can. Yeah, sorry, the person says, yeah. We can marvel at the crave brilliance of Kanye West, Virgil Abloh, and Tremaine Emery, but there's something profoundly fascinating that they all got to the highest echelons of global fashion using black culture capital, and not a single one of them has a black wife. Interesting. Another one says, LOL, I'm not going to even get started, but it's crazy because the most upright Negro negatuses people in this world don't even marry black queens don't even make sense there's nothing you can do to explain this scenario because i know how my black parents raised me which is interesting because essentially you're saying your black parents parents told you that you can't love outside of your race at all under any circumstances which is kind of crazy but hey let's continue um it's always the identity crisis brothers that are the most pro-black um ain't this nigga the one that put slaves on a t-shirt lmao my people losing it man another one says oh nah nigga gonna start shouting dead in tears went to go marry um cause of said tears you can't make this one up another one says pro black thing is the easiest money grab another one says i just can't get past him wanting to sell t-shirts of black people being lynched to suburban white kids another one says what the tremaine Another one says, this nigga with a fascination for cotton logos and putting lynchings on t-shirts is swimming in the skin milk. Um, I wish I could say this. I wish I could say I saw this coming. Another one says, oh, that's a bit of a double entendre there, isn't it, right? Swimming in skin milk. Wish I could saw this one coming. Anyway, let's continue. Um, niggas like him probably think the pro-black thing um, to do is to marry a white woman. 
Yeah, probably. Um, another one says, LOR, most pro black gents don't marry black women. Another one says, duh, 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 duh. another one says, oh, I hate this nigga bitch even more now. Every single day on this earth is a comedy. So you got the kind of gist of what people are saying. To me, I've got a different way of looking at these things personally, right? A very different way of looking at them. Because in my personal opinion, maybe it's a European thing. I've never really understood the preference people have when it comes to race, personally. Especially if you live in a multicultural city. It's almost limiting your options to be like i only date a certain type of people it's really odd it's really strange because the whole beauty of living in a metropolitan multicultural city is that you get to interact with so many different people from all around the world and depending on what industries or what sector of the you know job market you work in you might inter intersect with different people who you probably would never see in your everyday life that might lead to you having some different relationships and friendships that you probably would never have if you didn't work in said field. So all these things sort of influence your decisions in terms of who you date. And the reality of it is sometimes, which people don't know what I talk about, there is a really odd double standard that exists on social media when it comes to black guys who date white and white women who date white. When you see a quote-unquote black queen with her white guy and a knight in shining armor, figuratively speaking, you see a lot of people in the comments celebrating it, being happy of it, because usually, for whatever reason, the white dudes who are into black girls on social are like incredible boyfriends. They go out of their way to give them crazy gifts. They're always loving them in in full chest hd out on the timeline saying crazy things about them taking them on surprise dates like all the things that girls love boys to do um romantically for them especially in a social media kind of you know uh, kind of way of things those guys do really well so props to them but you definitely see a better reaction a more positive reaction to people seeing a black queen with a white guy than a white black guy with a white girl which is odd to me because i feel like if you don't if you have an issue with people dating outside of the race which is odd but if you have that issue fair enough it should apply across the board you shouldn't have a double standards way of looking at things where you think oh because it's a woman it's okay because black guys are trifling and they're down they're down bad they're no good so it's only natural that she'd have to go outside of the race because black guys are fucking you know the waste of space they're absentee dads and shit they're horrible they're cheese all this stuff people say they justify that by you know them going and choosing white but then when a black guy does it suddenly it's an issue so the double standards for me have always been a problem i'd never really understood that the decision to only date a certain people because that's what you're into and limiting yourself is also odd because you're limiting yourself to not being open to love in all its different shapes and sizes colors and creeds but again what do i know right but i do understand how funny it is for someone like tremaine who's been on a campaign to sort of remind people of his blackness to sort of make that his front and center message when it comes to his artistry and his practice and shit to also be the same dude who's sitting there saying supreme is systemically racist and then coming out with the most whitest girl you could ever come out with right again no snock on her but it's just funny to just see that i understand that just the humor of that contrast is very very funny because we also never saw i never saw it maybe he kept it secret i don't really know maybe i wasn't looking too deeply enough but i also never saw an inkling of what she looked like before I knew that he had a partner because I think he mentioned it in a couple of interviews, but he never actually saw what she looked like. So maybe there was a purposeful attempt to keep her off the timeline so she doesn't get abuse. And obviously because he maybe had a known the reaction of what it would have been considering the things he speaks about. But it also throws up another question. Can you not be pro-black and also date outside your race? Why does one thing impact the other? Why can't you be advocating for your people, but also when it comes to your friendships? And Because no one says that if you have only white friends, really. You don't really see people throwing out the same type of comments if all your friends happen to be white. But when it comes to dating white, suddenly you're a race traitor or something. Like It's very odd. So I don't really know why that happens. Um, the comforting thing for these guys, these newlyweds, is that it only exists on the internet for the most part. No one's really going to say anything to you in real life about who you decide to love, who you decide to fucking spend the life, rest of your life with. It's really no one's business. And most of the time, they never will say anything. You might get the odd, you know, 
a weird look from a couple of people from your community but apart from that it usually isn't a problem so it wouldn't really matter but like i said the double standards on social media are super 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 interesting but there also is maybe a little bit of um credence to the idea that maybe the guy wouldn't have the greatest options if he did try and date in his race anyway because that's the other cold reality of the truth of this situation that people don't like to talk about and i think i've mentioned it myself in some of my experiences when i was growing up uh, them as being quote-unquote multicultural but they did have probably a majority of black people and you know a, a, what i'd call black and brown people that kind of depicting asians kind of being part of the brown people group and for the most part because you know i lived in kind of poor areas and whatnot these kind of schools would usually have the same amount of people, you know, racial breakdown people that there are in there. But I unfortunately um, was sort of like the person that was into things that maybe people within my racial group aren't necessarily into. When it comes to the music I listen to, when it comes to skateboarding, when it comes to, you know, other things I was into, it didn't really align with how most people within my racial demographic acted. So again, I didn't blame the girls really because I thought if you had to compare me to the quote unquote hot boy in the hood, um, I probably didn't line up or didn't compete well with that guy or girl because I didn't wear certain things. I didn't listen to certain things. I didn't talk a certain way. So I understand it. It just made it difficult. It didn't make it impossible. It just made it difficult like to kind of date black girls because they just didn't see me as cool. But over time, I think what I realized, it was less so about what I was into and more so about me not having any risk, not having any game. The moment I started to develop a little bit more ability to talk to girls, suddenly it didn't really matter what they looked like or what I looked like. There would always be a sometimes a opportunity for an interest there to be had. So I like that to happen. I like that happening. And I think as life progressed and I got a bit older, I started to have a little bit more success with dating black girls because I just had better game and I was able to kind of, you know, it didn't really matter what I looked like or what interest I had. They were able to maybe see past that and see that I was a quote unquote good guy. But I'm sure there are some people who don't have my experience, who maybe have the experience of always getting rejected by people that look like you. Then suddenly you move away and go to college somewhere, uh, maybe in an area not like yours. Maybe the racial breakdown is a little bit more skewed the white way. And now suddenly all the things that used to get teased about or that would count you out or rule you out with certain girls are now the things that are making you attractive to them. Now, some of it can be a little bit uncomfortable because some of the girls could also have a fetish for black guys because you're the sort of, for lack of a better term, the exotic option they've never had before because they've always lived in a white area. So having this, you know, this streetwear mandingo next to them might be something that might amuse them. But I feel like there are so many kind of things that go into people's dating decisions that it really is no one's business and it really doesn't matter why they decide to go for it. I think it should be more so the works that you do, the things that you do for people should count more than who you actually date. That should be a better qualifier of are you helpful to your race or whatnot? Are you trying to push things forward, create a different, a better future for people that look like you coming up next you know, round? Because most likely you would assume with Denim Tears' features or Tremaine's features and shit, no matter what happens they're probably going to have a kid that's going to be considered to be more black than it is white most likely so even though you are dating technically outside of your race you're still going to have a kid that's going to navigate the world and quickly understand that even though their mom is white and their dad is black the world sees them as being black so in fact you're still raising a black child. You know what I mean? So like all that stuff that people talk about is kind of mute because that kid's still going to go through the same things that people like me go through and other people and stuff um, when it comes to discrimination and shit. So that kind of adds to it. But I think at the crux of it, for me, it's disappointing, like I said before, because I feel like this video of Tremaine walking out of the courthouse with his wife-to-be and stuff is legitimately one of the more depressing and detressing things about it because he's quite young and the fact that he's struggling to walk the way that he is after suffering an aneurysm that should be the thing people should be focusing on more and sending this guy's praying his prayers and wishing healing on him so that he can get back to how he was before because you know to see somebody like as young as him go through what he went through having to walk with a cane every single day looking like he's sitting down every place he's going to going that online we see him at different events he's always sitting down and shit because clearly maybe his legs are hurting him he's still trying to get used to walking the way that he does and whatnot it's just sad to see and i think people should probably be concentrating more on that and sending him well wishes of getting well soon than trying to pick apart his 
you know, who he decides to date and shit. It's not really that interesting, to be honest. Don't get me wrong, there's a chuckle to be had, as people have mentioned on these threads that I'm kind of reading here, these quotes on Twitter and shit. People are mentioning the hypocrisy of it all. I get it. But I think overall, the general message should be, you know, let's maybe try and push the idea of guys treating whoever they're with with levels of respect and decency and love let's make sure that if they do decide to have kids that they're not a deadbeat dad those things should be way more important than making sure the person that they're dating is of a certain color and creed especially with the way the world is at the moment live in most metropolitan cities most multicultural cities most bustling cities especially places like new york there's many people that you're crossing paths with on a daily basis who just limit yourself to only dating within a certain race pool is really odd the same way it's odd with guys who only like latina girls and shit it's just all strange to me personally i'd never really understood that kind of um way of thinking but again we're all made different i saw people talking about it on timeline for a report about it on here i'm getting bored of talking about it right now and i just wish them all the best going forward wish them all the best going forward moving on from that one i want to mention this quickly right because i thought this is super interesting so tyler creator new brand which has been out for a while now called golf le fleur he's put out some fragrances he's done the thing that i kind of wanted to do when i when i was thinking about having a brand like hey instead of coming out with just clothes straight away why not start to do like other things like maybe start to do accessories maybe start to do fragrances wallets and then kind of build it up sort of like in a reverse so like i was thinking in my head when it comes to brands why not try and start with a diffusion line then lead it up to into a mainline brand. That's kind of how I was thinking about it. Let's try and flip it um, upside down and start doing something fresh. And Tyler Creator done something fresh and new with Golf Le Fleur because it's basically the grown up version of golf. And essentially, it's his ability to sort of like do more fun, interesting, creative things that are more probably in line with his actual interests when it comes to traveling, when it comes to fragrances, when it comes to clothing design and shit. And this recent collaboration with Lacoste for me is an indication of maybe how underrated and talented he might be as a designer and i think might be a good prediction as to maybe why you might see tyler creator taking up a job as a fashion director for a big brand or something coming up very very soon because this collection with lacoste this collaboration is very very good i'm not gonna lie so it says as follows um not says as follows but it's a collaboration with lacoste you see here on the site we've got the lookbook we've got this lovely cardigan with these amazing pearl um buttons with this gold sort of like ribbon reef design on the outside i think it's pearl or it might be some something else to crystal i don't know what that is i think it's pearl in this lovely kelly green color that tyler's kind of known for sort of like his signature color right this sort of like kelly green forest green type of colorway you've also got this amazing um knitwear i think what is that is that like a i'm just sure what that is that looks i look it must look like a, it looks like what you'd call a cable knit but it's made into like a, a polo which looks fucking beautiful again with the two buttons here with that same sort of motif on it with the pearls you've got another great classic lacoste tee you've got an amazing um varsity jacket looking type of one with no elastic ribbing on the bottom which i really love the effect of you've got a nice um herringbone i guess what's it called herringbone or check print sort of shirt there the guy or the guy or girl whoever this is modeling kind of looks a little bit ian connor in this picture here to be honest it's got that sinister sort of smile you've got this really nice cardigan again and you've got the polo there worn once more and i actually want to see what it looks like in the storm so and obviously a t-shirt but to me this was maybe an indication that maybe tyler has the ability to be able to design for uh you know a major house sometime very soon we might actually see that a brand he might be one of the undercover people coming up that no one really thought of that could potentially um have the ability and option to kind of take over some of these big places we might actually see it because this stuff for the cost was surprisingly very very well done very well put together to the point where i'm thinking hey if this happened like i could see him definitely get a role somewhere and again even the even the the trailer 
advertisement that he put together the little short film was really well done also and sort of did a good job of sort of depicting the sort of stuff that he was trying to get across when it comes to the collection itself but if we see it available here in the store all this all the things lining up you've got the cream knit cardigan you've got the herringbone jacket Her harrington jacket sorry not herringbone Her Her harrington jacket um you've got the varsity jacket you've got a blue sweater vest you've got a green crew knit cardigan You've got a green long sleeve knit polo, knit the the obviously the green PK polos. You've got tan pleated trousers. You've got a pleated skirt, socks, like really well done. And of course, some necklaces, a necklace and a bracelet. But let's check through some of the things. Let's go to the Harrington jacket itself because I want to know what that print is. I'm not sure if it's tartan, if it's herringbone. It says here a four, sorry, a collared uh, jacket in a jacket twill featuring a center front zip, front welt pockets, and contrasting lining, accented by pearl buttons at the cuffs and co-branded crocodile at the chest. So it's a, what they say? A jacket twill print. That looks fucking beautiful. I'm not going to lie. That looks really, really, really good. Let's go to some of the next pictures here. Oh yeah, you've got some of the buttons here the, on, on the cuffs and on the back where you meant to cinch the jacket. It looks really well done. Not going to lie. I really do enjoy how that's been put together. You've got this lovely round pull um, zip here on the jumper itself. I love the tonal logo. So it doesn't stick out too much. Then across the floor here as well. And then more details in the buttons too. Where's that other badge? Okay, the other badge is here at the bottom as well. You can obviously debadge that if you want and make it look a little bit more classy by not having a white label on there. But I don't really mind the white label, not going to lie. Another of my favorites is definitely this varsity jacket. This is definitely one of my favorites. Um, I think it's like $500, isn't it? Last time I checked. Yeah, it's like, oh, even more. $8.95. God damn. Is it sold out any other sizes? No. Okay. Is it sold out in XL? Let's see. It must be sold out in XL okay it's not sold out interesting large and okay still very available but um yeah classic um colligate jacket in a warm wall featuring ribbed cuffs contrasting piping and snap closures front and back i sent it with co branded patches as well as a uh chain stinch um embroidery and offered for an authentic feel i love the look of it man it looks fucking beautiful to be fair I love the fact that he hasn't got the ribbing or the elastic cuff um, at the bottom here. You kind of got this really straight, flat design. I love the look of it. It sort of looks like a varsity jacket version of a coach jacket, if that makes any complete sense. But again, nice little logo design here on the back. The floor, the cost on the back as well, embroidered with the massive crocodile print on there on the back too. Logo, sorry. And of course, some of the pockets on the inside and other bits and pieces on there. So like I said before, I've got a feeling maybe Tyler, the creator, might be an undercover person to consider for some of the big fashion jobs out there. He's got the necessary fame. He's got the clout. He's got the design chops. He's got the fan base to really make a bit of a crazy leap and be the main guy that's sort of like in charge of designing everything that they do going forward. Like imagine if the Lacoste thing is such a success that they're like, you know what? come in house and be our lead creative on these sort of things going forward that might actually be a sick thing to see in the future so keep your eyes peeled for it again tyler Cray is always surprising to see his evolve you know him evolving little by little with his collection he's doing over there with flipping golf and all the other stuff that he does and i can't wait to see how it develops over the future so big up tyler the creator this stuff looks absolutely impressive really amazing and i can't wait to see what else he does in the future going forward i can't wait to see what else in the future he does going forward going forward going forward and then of course we need to end it with this news which is quite crazy to be fair but big up um, Birkenstock for this information and for the position at the moment. This is courtesy of the Financial Times. And it says Birkenstock has been valued at 8.6 billion after pricing IPO in the middle of the range. So all those collaborations, um, all of that kind of push into the culture of into streetwear into all the hype shit the stuff that i'm sort of kind of involved with and a fan of has definitely paid dividends because i feel like maybe that extra bit of income that extra bit of attention that extra bit of kind of you know um jolt of excitement into their brand has led to it being where it's where to i think guys and girls who are not really involved in that scene have always kind of had an understanding of what birkenstocks is they've been obviously super successful before people like myself in the scene that i'm into got into it but for sure I think some of the collaborations and the work that they've done with some of the smaller core audiences out there have definitely added to the, you know, the overall valuation of the brand. And this is kind of cool to see. 
So it says here, um, German sandal maker Birkenstock priced its shares at $46 in an initial price offering ahead of its first day of trading on Wednesday, giving the company a market valuation of $8.6 billion. The price is the middle of the range to $44 to $49 set by the company last week, reflecting demand for its shares and the groups um, perpetuates a revival of the US IPO market after a dearth of deals in the start of 2022. Birkenstock's public debut will raise about 1.5 billion with a further the proceeds going to the company to repay the debt and the rest of the private equity owner L Catterton on a daily on a fully diluted basis which takes into account stock options and other options it's said to be the third largest US listings of the year according to a um, deal logic uh, deal logic data Birkenstock will trade on the New York Stock Exchange um, L Catterton which was backed by French luxury house L LVMH of course, it was bought a majority stake in a $4 billion deal in 2021. The first time Burger Stock had been taken private equity financing. The company and its advisors have lined up and uh, anchor investors for the deal. Um, financier Agash and family holding company of VMA's chief executive Bernard Arnault have indicated an interest in purchasing up to 325 million worth of shares, according to the prospectus of the following. Arnault's son, Alexander, is better. <laughs> Honestly, man, he lucked out, innit? Alexandre, oh no, has fucking lucked out. He's got fucking Tiffany's under his belt. He's got Ramoa under his belt. And now he's got fucking Birkenstock. Fucking crazy. I know son Alexandre is expected to join the company's board of directors following the IPO. The Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund and Durable Capital Partners also plan to buy to further their 300 million net worth of shares. Birkenstock, which traded its roots back to 1774, reported revenue of 1.1 billion in the nine months to the end of June, up to 21% year on year. However, the net profits dropped to 20%. So again, crazy level of valuation, but makes complete sense considering how ubiquitous they are and how often you just see them, especially when you get to some of the hipstery areas around the country or around London, you definitely see a bunch of people wearing Birkenstocks now way more than they did previously. And you're seeing them become a bit more of a lifestyle option than just a convenience thing. And that definitely maybe explains why they've skyrocketed over the years and become even more popular. And of course, the collaborations where you get these special limited edition ones that are only sold in certain stores and shit or for a limited time frame in Birkenstock shop themselves, I think has probably been a decent surprise too because i'd imagine much like dr martin's in the past that i used to work at there was really not that many collaborations going on so a lot of people that were coming to buy boots would usually be the type of people that you describe or you'd think about when they're trying to wear buy boots kind of you know whatever scene that they're in da, 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 da. but then obviously as the collaborations started to pour in it started to really change the makeup of the people that were coming into the store. It was way different people from way different backgrounds who were coming in to buy these boots because of the collaborators who are making those boots way more appealing. So even though it's a smaller market and the games aren't as huge, it for sure adds to the overall cachet and the law of a brand like Birkenstock to be associated with so many of these little fringe underground sort of like, you know, sub genres and whatever else that exists out there. So big up Birkenstock, 8.6 billion. Hopefully some of that money goes to fucking increase some people's salaries out there. Probably won't, but hey, one can hope, one can hope. Anyway, that's been the Exxon Zing Show episode number 715. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you've enjoyed the show so far and you like what you see, you like what you've heard, make sure that you share it. Make sure you leave me a five-star review. Make sure you like it. All that stuff that you can do on a platform that you're on would be very appreciated. If you listen to the audio side of the podcast, you will hear my tune today playing under my sultry tones. And I'll see you again very soon. Make sure you're back again. Take care. Be safe, everybody. Peace.